Are we live? No, it doesn't look like we're live. Um, not sure what happened. Oh, we are live, sorry. <laughs> sorry about that. Uh, I had to play the play button on the live stream. Who knew, right? Okay, anyway, so welcome everyone to the second round of uh, live Q&A. Uh, we had a very successful first round uh, about a week ago and uh, I've heard just so many comments eh, about how well it went and how much they enjoyed the, the event. And so uh, many of them uh, asked me if I could uh, arrange a, a second round. And so, so I have. So uh, I have uh, four panelists with me today, and I'd like to uh, introduce them to you. I have uh, also a fresh set of questions as well. Um, so I'll explain how this will work um, in a bit. But uh, let me first introduce you, our first panelist. So he is uh, currently a PhD candidate in psychology. Uh, he's studying at uh, Divine Mercy University in uh, Washington, DC, and uh, he is a former uh, vocation director. So when I was ordained, uh, he was the one who presented me to the bishop at the ordination. Um, and I'm so glad that he has come back to Vancouver for the summer and is able to join us tonight. So uh, welcome, Father Brian Duggan. Thanks, Father Paul. Uh, a great joy to, uh, to be with you this evening, um, and an even greater joy to be back in Vancouver, <laughs> uh, despite the circumstances, of course, that are, are most unfortunate, but um, it's uh, offered me the opportunity anyway to, to, be, to be home for a brief interim in between um, this semester and next. Um, and yeah, thank you, Father Paul, for putting this together and for your, your great work, um, such wonderful initiative with the uh, um, all the social media uh, presence that you've been been doing for the people in our archdiocese so thank you great thank you now next up uh he is an instructor at saint mark's college um he teaches sacred sacred scripture and he has uh, a master's degree in sacred scripture from rome and he's also a phd, PhD candidate in sacred scripture um, so welcome, Father Nick Meisel. Hello. Thank you very much, Father Paul. It's great to be here this evening. I'm looking forward to this. Uh, thanks for inviting me. Okay. And uh, as Father Brian commented earlier, you look very uh, studious in the back there. Yeah, they're all <laughs> fake. Yeah, every <laughs> night. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we've got some good questions for you tonight. Okay. Next, I would like to introduce uh, a sister. She is the Archbishop's Delegate for Consecrated Life in the Archdiocese. She is a Dominican sister. Uh, and she is also in charge of women's vocations in Vancouver. So welcome, Sister Mary Sabina Demuth. Good afternoon, or I guess good evening. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. And I'm excited to be with all of the people on the panel. Father Brian was the first vocation director I worked with. So it's exciting to be back here with him and then also um, to have a fellow sister with me. So thanks for having us. Great, great. Thank you, sister. And how long have you been a sister? I've been a sister for 17 years since I've made first vows, 19 years since I entered the convent. Okay, wonderful, wonderful. And um, now I'd like to introduce another sister. She is the Associate Director of Ministries and Outreach, uh, working at uh, Pastoral Center. And she has a background in counseling as well. Uh, so welcome Sister John Mary Sullivan. She is a sister belonging to the Franciscans, Franciscan Sisters of the Eucharist. 
Hello, everyone. Great to be here with our panelists. And Father, thank you for putting this together. And I second Father Brian's um, comments on your work with all the young adults and just making the church so available in this time of um, pandemic. So thank you for what you're doing. And it's a joy to be here. And I'm looking forward to tag teaming, teaming with Sister Mary Sabina. Here we go. <laughs> all right. Yeah. Uh, uh, just a tidbit about uh, Sister John Mary. Um, you can't go. Uh, without uh, mentioning this. So sh she is an expert juggler, in case you didn't know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if you didn't know, the next time you see her, ask her if she could uh, show it to you. <laughs> okay. So now I'd like to... Um, uh, thank uh, all of you who are uh, watching uh, in the Zoom meeting right now and also on YouTube. Um, for those of you who sent us questions, you're in, in Zoom and uh, I, I'd like to especially thank you for your excellent questions. So we'll get to them shortly. I'll just briefly explain how the event will proceed. So we will um, get to those questions, the submitted questions for the first uh, 25 minutes or so. And then we'll have a brief intermission and we have uh, a special performance uh, ready for you. And then we'll, uh, after that, get to questions from the live audience uh, in the YouTube comment box. And so if you have any questions, you know, as you're listening to this, uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to write them in and uh, we'll see if we could uh, answer them for you. Um, so that's how it'll proceed. And like last time, we will um, do, it in, do it kind of in a Jeopardy style. And so we'll have categories to choose from. We'll kind of take turns. Uh, the panelists will take turns in choosing a category. And um, that question would be open to just the whole panel. So anybody could answer it. Okay? Not, not necessarily just the, the person who's picked that category. So, uh, so uh, panelists, you don't have to uh, just pick the easiest one. Uh, just pick anything, <laughs> and you'll, you'll be fine. Okay, so Brian, if you could show us the uh, categories. Great, so we have eight categories. Life during the pandemic, a walk in the park, life in the pews, back to seminary, discerning vocation, I am struggling, I love RCAV, Roman Catholic Archdiocese of Vancouver, and morale booster. That's actually not a Question, um, something to keep us going if we ever get tired. So how about we start with um, Father Brian? Okay. Um, well, let us uh, start with uh, a walk in the park. <clears throat> Sounds easy. Okay, this is our first question. How has your studies in other fields, scripture, psychology, computer science, engineering, and et cetera, enhanced your ministry? Okay. Yeah. So I can see how um, uh, psychology applies to you, Father Brian. Uh, scripture applies to Father Nick. Computer science would apply to me. Uh, engineering. Who's on engineering here? Also Father Nick. Also Father Nick. The man okay. of many skills. Yes. <laughs> and Sister jo uh, John Mary has a yeah, counseling background. And Sister Mary Sabina, uh, of course, you're a high school teacher. Um, did you have any previous studies before you joined the Dominicans? So 
So I studied theology in university. And then after I became a sister, I studied education and scripture and more education. So <laughs> mine are kind of obvious. Great, great, great. Um, so yeah, if anybody uh, would like to chime in here. Sure, I mean, I, I'll, uh, I can start us off. Um, although I, I have to say I was misled by the title. I was expecting something about, uh, you know, going hiking or, um, or something to do with walking or parks, but uh, nonetheless. <laughs> Um, I, uh, I've been so blessed with the opportunity to study psychology. It's really, um, such a great, uh, connection with, with the faith. I'm particularly blessed to study, uh, at the school that I am, um, Divine Mercy University is, um, kind of, you know, leading the, the, uh, it's on the forefront, certainly in the integration of, of faith, of a Christian anthropology and, um, and very robust, uh, psychology. It's APA accredited. Um, and, uh, and yeah, I, I think, you know, there's just such a great connection between the two that, that um, a lot of people, especially priests and religious uh, involved in spiritual direction, talk about the, the kind of different modes of spiritual direction that, that, that often involve a real focus on the human uh, at different times in different ways. And, and, um, and so an understanding of of kind of the psychological dynamics that are at work um, in our um, in just how we relate to others, how we understand ourselves, how we understand the world, um, and and what aspects of that might be healthy, what might not be healthy, and where God is at work in that, and desiring uh, greater freedom, interior freedom, and, and healing uh, for each of us. Um, so I, I've, I've, I see the two as, as very, uh, very interrelated and, um, and mutually enriching. Um, so that's been a real gift for me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Father. Anyone else would like to add to that? I, I could add, Father. Please. Um, so I, I came into uh, a religious life with a theology degree in marriage and family. And then when I entered, I was asked to go back and do a counseling degree in marriage and family therapy. And um, what it just reaffirms in me and is how our faith um, leads us to truth that others discover in other ways, but are reaffirmed over and over again when you start studying like the science of marriage and family um, therapy and dynamics and systems, it all points back to what our faith has always um, spoken of and revealed in terms of the human person and dynamics and relationship and God himself. And so um, it it's a great gift to go in and be able to go into because our faith also respects the science of it as well so firmly. And so to be able to go in equipped with the theology into the science was, has been a huge blessing and um, continues to help me interact with others. Okay, thank you, sister. I think Father Nick wanted to say something like you wanted to. Okay, yeah, thanks. I was having a hard time unmuting myself. <laughs> Yeah, so it took me quite a while to figure out that I, I should be a priest. I was kind of slow. And so I studied engineering before, and that was like a really, yeah, something that was really beneficial for me when I look back on it. Um, yeah, I got to work in different places, so different skills like problem solving. If my computer is broken, I can usually fix it. Which is <laughs> and then, yeah, studying scripture, a lot of my ministry now is teaching. So I get, I've had, I've got the opportunity to teach some math. So I've used my engineering a little bit that way, but also like, yeah, learning about the Bible. I love, and I love teaching that. And yeah, it's helpful also in, in retreats and talks. So yeah, it's just been very beneficial for me. I don't use like engineering stuff very often, but like <laughs> experiences and the, the skills I learned have been very helpful. Great. Thank you, Father Nick. I think we can move on to the next category. Brian? 
Father Nick, would you select the category for us? Uh, I'll go with I love RCAV. <laughs> Alec? Okay, it? so the question is, what is one of the biggest issues regarding priestly formation in RCAV? <laughs> oh, my. <laughs> oh, wow. This isn't at all controversial. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I mean, I think I think our, our priestly formation, we have so many um, strengths in our diocese as well. I think like everywhere, like that aspect of human formation is is like important everywhere, right? That, yeah, we need to grow in maturity, that we need to grow so we can be fathers to others. So I think that's, yeah, for, and I think that's everywhere, especially like now and more and more we're realizing that, but I, I think that's, yeah, all over the place. That's all I'll say about that. <laughs> Thank you, Father. <laughs> <laughs> and something that's uh, um, something about, very close to my heart, if yeah, I yeah, yeah, uh, uh, is um, the transition from seminary mm -hmm. to priestly life. Mm -hmm. I think that's an area that we could do a lot uh, to help to help new priests with. Um, I think, as, as Father Nick was mentioning, there's there's certainly areas in priestly in seminary itself that that um, that uh, there's always room for improvement, of course, uh, and human formation is certainly a focus these days. Um, but I think that the point of transition too is really important, really crucial. And there's a lot about priestly life that is really learned on the job, so to speak, uh, especially in diocesan life where the seminary life is so different from life in the parish or life in ministry. And uh, so I think that's an area that I would love to see um, and I think the Archbishop and, and, uh, and others in the diocese are working on that. Um, uh, it's always been a priority and, and they're working on it, but um, I would love to see even more effort made um, to help with that transition and really provide the, the training to help men succeed and flourish um, in that transition. Thank you, Father Brian. Um, and if I may yeah, chime in a little bit on this, I... I mean, there, there are many things, yeah, we could uh, do better, but uh, I think one key thing is integration. So uh, I think seminarians are good with theology and uh, uh, ideas, uh, working with ideas, but uh, uh, I think that the trick is to uh, make those ideas come alive. And so basically, you know, bringing what they know in the head down to the level of the heart um, and to really integrate it. Uh, meaning that those ideas become part of them, like who they are, and they live them out. Um, I think that integration um, is, is, a, is a challenge um, uh, for anybody, really. But uh, I think it's especially important for seminarians and priests to um, really make sure that uh, they have uh, done the integration properly. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so we'll move on to the next category. And Sister Mary Sabina. Um, I will take, as a sister, I will take life in the pews because we are also in the pews. <laughs> okay, the question is, a priest once told me that if my initial decision was made with peace in my heart, it means that it was what God wanted me to do or where he wanted me to be. But is peace always a signifier for discernment? How does one discern if something is the will of the Father and not one's own desires? <laughs> That's a good question. I guess I'll say something first because I was just talking, this is probably one of the things I say a lot as well, um, that peace is something that only comes from Christ. So that is, I, I don't know if it, I would say it's the only signifier, but I would say it is a major signifier, if not the greatest signifier. I was reading even in the Bible this past week, Jesus says, peace I give you, my peace I leave you, multiple times. And he says it 
um, in John before the passion, and then he says it again at the ascension. And so every time he wants to encourage the disciples in their mission, he gives them peace. And I, and I think that's significant for us to pay attention to. And we also know that um, the enemy, he's never going to bring peace. He brings the opposite of peace. And we ourselves are not the source of our own peace. And so I do think peace is something that comes from God and that we need to really pay attention to, especially in our discernment of our vocation, but also in day-to-day -day life. If I'm not at peace, then I need to take that to prayer and find out why I'm not at peace. Is it, is it something in my life that I'm not responding well to? Am I not responding to a grace? Am I under some kind of attack? But I know that peace comes from Christ and I can be suffering in peace. And so I think that's how we know that really God is present. Christ is present is when we can have a sense of peace, even when everything else around us is chaos and, and seems like it's not what we want it to be. Um, so I, I, would, I would agree with the priest that peace is a major signifier um, that we should pay attention to. Um, and I'll hand it off to anybody else who wants to add to that. <laughs> Thank you, sister. Anybody else? Well, something that comes to mind for me is just um, uh, also, what do we mean by peace? Uh, and uh, yeah, I so appreciate Sister Sabina, your, um, you know, only peace comes from from Christ and it's it's kind of like the his calling card, the signature of his presence in our lives. Uh, and that's different that kind of peace is so different from like comfort or, or sort of a, a place of kind of a lack of, of tension or lack of, of, of struggle. Um, so I think that's also a helpful piece of discernment is, is to, uh, no pun intended, piece of discernment. Um, <laughs> you know, to, uh, to, yeah, to reflect on, on, on is this the peace of Christ that I'm experiencing? Or am I, am I on a path of comfort or a path of, of sort of the least resistance, um, which, is, which is not, I mean, sometimes that's part of, of that's a season in our lives, uh, as part of God's will, but just to discern that, not to equate comfort with, with peace. Thank you, Father Grant. I think we can move on to the next category. And Sister Sean Mary. Uh, let's go with I am struggling. <laughs> How does one come to understand their own sexuality when they pursue a vocation? How do you overcome your own natural inclination or sexual drive? Strictly speaking, if you have an addiction to porn or masturbation, should you even deeply pursue a vocation you still have these struggles? A nice light one for me. <laughs> uh, you know, it is, um, first of all, you don't, I would say you don't overcome your natural inclinations and sexual drives. You um, direct it in a way that is life-giving. So our sexual drives whether you're married or in religious life or a priest um, are meant for life, for new life. And so um, the question is more, how do you begin to direct it in a way that is life-giving and fruitful? Um, and I would say, and fathers, you can speak into this as well, and sister, um, if you're struggling with addiction to pornography, masturbation, it's something to work through because no matter where you go, you know, what, how you proceed in life, those, that's going to hold you back from a fulfillment. And so it's not something that dismisses the, the possibility of your vocation to priesthood or religious life, um, but it's definitely something you want to work on and, um, and seek help. There are people out there and, and even within our archdiocese, we have um, we have a counselor that is specifically trained in this and so um, in helping people with the addiction. So I would say seek the help that you need 
to overcome it. And like any sin um, or anything that hinders new life within us, um, keep battling it, you know, uh, don't let it sway you from what God wants from you and desires for you. Thank you, Sister. And I think I would add, if I could, not just pornography and masturbation, those are kind of obvious with religious life and priesthood because of celibacy and chastity, but any addiction that is at work in your life is going to be enslaving you in some way. And the whole point of a vocation is responding in freedom. And so you want to be free from any serious addiction to pursue religious life because that's because you're you're called to give a gift of self and that self needs to be integrated not perfect not perfected but on that path of integration and you're not going to really have the freedom to make a gift of self until your life has some sort of order to it um, on all levels and so it's not just those sexual addictions it's other addictions as well that you we need to work through on a human level to be able to respond to the vocation to which God is calling us so that we can be life-giving, as Sister said. Thank you, Sister. Yeah, I, I so appreciate, Sisters, your, your, your words and, and that, that, you know, that it's so important, that question of freedom, to be able to freely give of ourselves, whatever our vocation or whatever our, our state in life. Um, and um, and that that encouragement to to face you know to face it. If there's an area of our life where we're struggling, where there seems to be some some habit, some pattern of, of, of sin, to not be afraid of that, to face it, and to to turn uh, you know to bring that into the light. Um, it, it, you know that that's a movement towards freedom. And, I, and I'm just so conscious of the shame that can so often surround uh, addiction, and, and and even these words can be can be heard as kind of like, oh, you know, I'm just, I'm so much f farther away than I should be, or I'm so far away from the possibility of freedom. And, um, and yeah, I just want to kind of speak encouragement um, to well, really to all of us that, that have these areas in our lives that, that can sometimes be, be so challenging. Um, that, that first of all, addictions are, are um, always symptoms of, of something much deeper. And so, um, when we're facing, when we're, we're, we're encountering a behavior that we sort of like, well, where did that come from? Or why is this in my life? There's always an invitation there. The Lord is speaking to us. He's like, come deeper. My son, my daughter, I love you. Let's go deeper. Let's look at these deeper places in your heart where I wish to be, to be present and to bring healing. And so there's nothing to fear. And there's no shame with the Lord. Um, he wishes to be with us in these places. And so, um, yeah, have no fear. Um, uh, if this is part of your story, if this is part of your, your life, the Lord is with you, he loves you, and he's very close to you. Thank you, Father Brian. I think we're ready for another category. Um, Father Brian. Oh, well, is it my turn again? Yeah. Um, what haven't we done? Let's... Uh... Let's try life during the pandemic. There has been an unfortunate amount of politicization about how governments should handle COVID-19. The Archdiocese of Vancouver is obviously agreeing with the provincial government's recommendation on social distancing and canceling large public gatherings, mass. However, is it wrong for individual Catholics to disagree with some of the government policies and see it as an overreach. By this, I mean in a philosophical sense, not to question the direction taken by the Archbishop. Hmm. Yeah, that's such a good question. Um, and you're not alone. You know, there's, there's lots of different opinions um, about how uh, responses, um, response at the civil level and, and, and also within the church. There's lots of disagreement and, and that's okay. Uh, there's nothing wrong with holding um, with believing something to be true, especially something that's, that's not kind of like a moral question of the church. Um, and, and the invitation there is always, of course, for all of us to humility, 
like, okay, this is not as I would have it. This is not as I would want it, um, but it is. And because it is, the Lord is in it, he's present. And, and there's an invitation to humility and, and certainly to obedience. You know that the Archbishop has, has made the best decision that he can, given the guidance that, that he's received and, and the circumstances. And so we, we trust and follow and, um, and, and that's really, really all we can do. Um, but not to be um, disturbed if, if we might have, might have a disagreement or think differently. There's nothing sinful in that, um, but always you know, the invitation to humility. I think that's fair to say. I, don't, I welcome correction from my peers. <laughs> yeah, I think that was a very good answer. Um, let's uh, move on to another category. Father Nick. Um, let's do uh, Life in the Pews. Um, I think that we uh, that one we've already done. Okay, so <laughs> if I choose first, or should I choose that one? Back to seminary. Let's do it. Okay. <laughs> I see the hint being dropped subtly. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Someone once told me that everyone is called to become like Mary, and that's why women cannot be priests. What does this mean? Um. Yeah, I don't know. It would be interesting to hear the, the whole context of the conversation. But yeah, certainly, um, yeah, the, the Marian vocation, right? Like to, to bring Christ into the world, that we're all called to, to follow Jesus, to discipleship, and to holiness. He warned us that he might be. Yeah, he's oh, okay. <laughs> one tough question. <laughs> Christian, did, did I did I drop out with my internet? Yeah, <laughs> just for like five seconds or so. Okay, sorry about that. Maybe it was a good thing. I'll I'll try. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, uh, I I think I was saying, yeah, that the Marian vocation like is is to discipleship to follow Jesus, and Mary did this in a way like. Yeah, no one was as good a follower of Jesus as Mary, right? So that's the most important vocation, the most beautiful one. That's what we're all primarily called to. And these other vocations, priesthood, religious life, are secondary. So yeah, that's I. Th um, I'm not sure how that fits into reasoning for women not being priests, but I, I not the, the link there would probably. Be, I have to hear the whole conversation. I think. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'd like to make sure we get to like, other questions as well that we haven't covered yet. So why don't we go to the category? I'd like to take discerning vocation for five. <laughs> <laughs> How did you know that was the last one? <laughs> <laughs> okay. When you had discerned your vocation and began your formation, did you ever feel that you were giving up your freedom? Mm -hmm. Are there times mm -hmm. when you feel like you have lost your freedom at all? Hmm. Wow. You know, my first response to that question is I felt more free when I started to live my vocation. Um, I, because I felt more free to be myself and to do everything God asked of me, I felt free to live in the way I wanted to live and felt made to live. Um, so now did a couple of times that I feel, especially in the convent, I think we probably have um, probably more appearing to have more limits to our freedom, but it's actually that life that gives us the freedom we were looking for to thrive. And so um, in my formation, did I ever struggle with some of those limits? Oh yes, um, because we're human and we come in with our own will and our own pridefulness and so yes are there times that we struggle on a human level with some of those natural elements of formation sure um but at the end of every day i could see how that was forming me to be who god wanted me to be and i was becoming more free the more i lived the life and so um, i wouldn't be willing to to take some of those freedoms so to speak if that meant i had to give up the life that i'm living 
And so um, it's, it's kind of a, this contradiction, but it's actually by actually became more free in giving those things up. And so uh, at least on my part, so. Thank you, sister. Okay, I think we're ready for our last category. So we'll just go ahead with that. It's morale booster. <laughs> so we have something prepared by Father Felix Min for all of us here. Um, let's have it. <laughs> That was it? Just a picture? No, 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 no. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. Brian, are you able to work this out? <laughs> yeah, I'll give it a try. There we go. Oh, a video clue. Yes. Oh, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> Father can do that, we can do anything. <laughs> He's very talented. We're so blessed to have him. <laughs> that is such a boy thing to do. <laughs> who, who, who needs human formation? I don't, I don't, I don't see the need for any. <laughs> His facial expression is very well integrated. <laughs> All right. Okay. So that um, concludes kind of the first uh, half of our uh, event. I would like to um, invite now a special guest. Um, uh, so Mona is one of the young adults in the virtual parish community. And she just released an original song uh, written and composed by her. And it's called mm -hmm. Little Flower. Oh. Uh, I think it's very special, and I, I really want to affirm um, her discipleship and her desire for uh, evangelization. And so I'd like to invite Mona. Um... Hello. I'm so happy I can be here. Um, I'm actually at a campsite right now, so <laughs> I hope I don't uh, freeze too much. Um, but yeah, I wrote this song. Um, similar to what was being said by Father, Father Brian Duggan, um, just accepting our humanity and our smallness and really allowing Christ to encourage us and um, find peace within, amidst the chaos. And yeah, very similar to what uh, St. Therese talked about when she was um, asking for an elevator to heaven. So yeah, I hope you enjoy it. <laughs> small these 
Wonderful. It wasn't that amazing. Thank you so much, Mona. Yeah, you're truly a guest. Um, thank you so much. Yeah, so we'll uh, now begin um, our second half, which is uh, to address the questions from the live audience. So if you have any questions, please uh, don't hesitate to write them in the chat box right now. Or you could uh, email them to us privately. Okay, um, we will try to answer some questions now. Okay. Okay, so here's one. So this is a question that had come in through uh, email. What are your thoughts on the use of weed, like marijuana? Father Nick? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think the, the bishops a letter on this right <laughs> so yeah it's it's legal now but it's for recreational uses would be immoral but for medicinal would be okay but then i would say especially like with younger people right like and maybe some of the others i think would know better but with the brain developing you have to be very very careful also with younger people i don't know what that age is but um yeah there, there's a letter so i would just direct them to that but I welcome other <laughs> points of view. Okay, thank you. We have another question in. Um, how do you remain strong in your decision to pursue your vocation or God's call for your life? And what helped you do so? I would say that um, relationship. It's um, most of our strength comes from love, right? Uh, uh, we, our will it can be weak at times, but when we're responding in love and in relationship, we know a strength that is not our own. And so um, I think what allowed me to stay strong was continuing to relate closely to my community when I first met them and um, just growing really in love with the community and in just a deepening of that relationship. And, and I would say, if you haven't met a community or you don't know if diocesan or religious is your call, um, think about those you are surrounded with. Who are your friends? Are they going to help you stay strong in what God desires for you and, and help you foster that? Um, that's where you will know great strength. Mm -hmm. Thank you, sister. Okay, how about this one? 
when Catholics see people making negative comments about their faith online, should they enter into those online debates for the sake of evangelization? Or is it wiser to not engage in the conversation? Should we get into a bit about that? <laughs> That's a tough one. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think it depends on the situation. If you have a sense of where the person is coming from, if they're sincerely asking a question, that can be an opportunity to witness. Um, I think that, um, you know, a lot of dialogue, especially in the comments section online, um, tends to be more trolling. Um, and, uh, and so I wonder about the efficacy of, uh, of such a, a debate. Um, are you really gonna change someone's mind or is it really just sort of for the sake of arguing? Um, but I think the larger question of social media presence um, is, is a great one. And I'm so, I so admire Father Paul, uh, you know, your work, especially um, these past few weeks, but even prior and Father Nick, um, you know, you've yeah. long had a great, great social media presence. Um, and so many others, lay and, and clergy alike in our diocese and elsewhere that, that are, are trying, you know, that, um, uh, what did, um, I think it was Pope Benedict say it was the digital continent. Mm. It was sort of like a missionary impulse to the, mm. this new territory. And, uh, and we need to be present. We absolutely need to, to have a presence and be attractive and be a witness and um, to show love and, and, and charity and joy and, and um, uh, and, and, and be that presence. Um, so we, we do need to be present. I think we need to be kind of thoughtful about how we are present. Thank you, Father Brian. Um, how about uh, this question? Um, okay, it's a scripture question. I was actually hoping that we get some <laughs> scripture questions because Father Nick is on the panel. Okay, did the Bible support genocide? Why did God command the genocide of the Canaanites, women and children included? Uh, first book of Samuel, chapter 15. Sorry, my internet cut out and I didn't even hear the question. I'm not even... Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I just came back and I was spotlighted. Quick. <laughs> <laughs> Try to avoid the tough question. <laughs> Scripture question, and then I didn't hear anything. Yes, I, I know Father Nick wouldn't avoid uh, any <laughs> scripture question. Oh. So the question is, uh, did the Bible support genocide? Why did God command the genocide of the Canaanites, women and children included? Uh, right. First book of Samuel, chapter 15. Yeah, first Samuel 15, we can look at Joshua 6 through 8. Right. So Dave Erbum tells us to read the Bible in accordance with the literary genre that's there. So those genres are not historical genres like that. We have obviously access to some history, but also like in Joshua in particular, it's this theological message that's being conveyed that when we follow God's law, God is always with us and he's on our side. And so, yeah, when if we read it like it's straight history, then it, we run into problems but it's a much more interesting and theological text. So the Bible, I think some people have read it that way to permit that God is permitting genocide, but that's not the way we would interpret it if we're reading it properly according to its genre. Okay. Thank you, Father Nick. Okay, uh, here's one question. Are minor seminarians considered quote unquote attached when attending a minor seminary? Or is it when you're a major seminarian that you're, quote unquote, attached to a diocese? Um, so if by minor seminary, you mean high school seminary like we have in, uh, in mission, because uh, sometimes the, word, the, the term minor seminary is also used to describe a college seminary. That's much more common, um, especially in the United States. So, uh, Generally speaking, in college seminary and theological seminary, um, you must be um, sponsored by a diocese or a religious order. Um, there is kind of a, a grandfathered, uh, unique situation in mission where for 
one year or so you might be studying independently while you're still discerning uh, in the college seminary, um, but that's quite rare. Um, at the high school, it's a whole different situation. The high school seminary is, is um, it's still a seminary, you know, has kind of that priestly orientation to it, but it's, it's more akin to a boarding school. And the vast majority of, of uh, high school seminarians do not continue on even into seminary, college seminary, let alone into the priesthood. Um, and so they don't need to be sponsored by a diocese or, or anything like that. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Father Brian. A question uh, from emails. Is there a specific process on how to dispose of broken items that have been blessed? I have a small statue of the Holy Family that is now unfortunately broken. I heard that I am not supposed to just throw it away, but I'm finding different instructions when I try to find an answer online. Well, in our community, we either burn it or we bury it. So because it's um, sacred. So at the convent, we have a nice big plot behind our house and they'll open it up every once in a while for us to put all of our broken religious or blessed broken religious articles in. But because it is, it's true. We don't wanna just throw something that's been blessed and set apart for um, holy uses into the regular trash or to the recycle bin. As good as recycling is, it is not appropriate to put sacred texts there. So usually if you can't, if it's something that can be burned in a fire, you can do that or you can bury it in your backyard or somewhere else appropriate, but feel free to correct me if I'm wrong, but <laughs> that's our practice. Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you, sister. I think you answered well. Um, so I um, have one announcement to make. Um, but before we do that, let's just get to one last question. And I think this is a kind of a last, uh, a good um, question to kind of close our Q&A tonight. Um, the question is, what would the future of our Archdiocese look like after coronavirus? I mean, it's really up to anybody's guess, but um, in your mind, yeah. What do you think the future would look like? You could. Um, share uh, a thought or two um, and kind of make this a, a closing remark on your part. I think that'd be great. Well, I know that's something that um, a lot of people are saying is that, you know, nothing is going to be the same, that this is really um, going to be a noticeable change um, uh, in, in many aspects of life. And I think our, our, our church life uh, is no different. Um, it's hard to say what exactly. I think, I mean, something like what we're doing now, you know, making more available uh, online using the um, platforms that are available, that's, I think, going to be more common. Live streaming masses will probably continue much more uh, regularly uh, for the homebound and, and others that are unable to attend. Um, so that kind of presence. Um, I find myself curious about what the, the significance of access to the sacraments, what that will, um, the, what, how that will unfold for, for many of us uh, in, the, in the months and, and years to come, you know, that suddenly we've not been able to access them. And so it's really kind of forced us to confront what, what, what does the mass mean to me uh, and the sacraments. And, 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 um, and it'll be interesting to see the response of the faithful when finally we are able to, to return to Mass um, and the sacraments on a more regular basis. Um, uh, yeah, I think it's a, there's an opportunity here. I think the Lord is at work and, and, um, and, and it'll be interesting to see how that, how that bears fruit in individuals' lives and our life as a, as a community. Thank you, Father Brian. Uh, Father Nick? Yeah, I mean, this um, pandemic has been really strange, hasn't it? Like all these experiences. I think, yeah, as far as I don't know what things will look like, but one thing I maybe hope is, yeah, during this time, we've all experienced like some sort of isolation, whether it's like loneliness, kind of feeling separated from people and having experienced that maybe when we go forward, then we can use that as an opportunity to be like, okay, there's people who actually experience this all the time not just in a time of pandemic. So hopefully mm -hmm. that can help us have that sympathy and drive us to reach out 
to people in our society, our church and beyond who, who experience this all the time. And we've kind of had that um, in our own lives during this time. So yeah, that's, but it's, yeah, it'll be very interesting. Okay, thank you, Father Nick. Uh, Sister Mary Sabina. Um, I'm hoping that we're gonna be more grateful. I think what Father Brian was saying with access to the sacraments, um, grateful for the Eucharist, grateful for the mass, grateful for confession, grateful for community. And, and I keep, I, I also teach high school part-time and I've told my students, not only might we be different, but I think we should be different after this time of pandemic. We've just been given time that we've all wanted for so long. How many of us have always been so busy that we can't pray or we can't Go, pray the rosary or we can't go to mass and now everything is gone um, but we desire it even more hopefully um, so I'm hoping we come back more fervent and more sincere and more grateful um, with a renewed appreciation for the gift of our faith and the gift of the sacraments um, so I'm, I'm actually a little bit I, I think there's a lot of suffering that will definitely need to be worked through but I think we're going to come back stronger and maybe a little more authentic. Okay, thank you, Sister Mary Savina. Sister John Mary. I'm also very hopeful. I think that the fact that the whole world knows this, um, suffering together, this, it's, it's a worldwide experience that has to move us within our very humanity. I mean, it, it just can't but impact us. And, um, and then I think in addition to a, an increased desire for the sacraments, increased desire to be with one another, it also has increased our own creativity and capacity to learn other ways of connection and intimacy and closeness. Um, I mean, when do you find 40 to 70 young adults who get together every single night to pray the rosary and then want a desire to do the divine mercy chaplet. That's when I check out, <laughs> gotta go to bed. <laughs> but I mean, and, and appreciation for the word scripture. I mean, all these things that we've had as part of our, the rich um, reality of our Catholic faith, we are accessing in a new way and um, my real hope is, yes, we go back and yes, the Eucharist is, as we know, the source and summit of our faith, but, but that we incorporate these things that we've relied on and now have sort of embodied in a new way. And it just expands our level of intimacy with each other and with our God and, and impacts our world. Let us sort of lead the world. If we're all suffering this together, let us show um, it's a great way of evangelization to say, this is how we suffer it as, as a body of Christ. This is how we suffer it with a Christian vision and view of reality. So, mm -hmm. Thank you, Sister John Mary. Uh, yeah, so speaking of creativity um, and <laughs> connection, uh, I'd like to invite uh, our seminarian, Paul, Paul Vo, to share a few words with us. Um, the seminarians, have exercised their creativity muscle to um, start an uh, initiative. Um, so thank you, Paul. Um, let's uh, show the, uh, the graphic, Brian. Okay, Paul. Hi, everyone. Uh, as uh, Father Paul said, I'm, my name is Paul Vo, and I am a seminarian for the Archdiocese of Vancouver. Um, <laughs> I am humbled by the photo uh, they've chosen. Uh, it's an old photo two years ago. Uh, I had a lot more hair back then, but anyway. <laughs> uh, yeah, um, for the past two weeks, the seminarians have been, um, we've been coming together uh, some of us, uh, but every night we've been praying and offering intentions we received from uh, all of you who've sent in your prayers. And um, I'm speaking on behalf of my brother seminarians. Uh, 
we are humbled and uh, and touched by the prayers we received. We received many prayers, uh, and yeah, I think we want to thank you guys for trusting us with these prayers. And uh, as well, we're asking um, for more prayers uh, to help us foster uh, a pastor's heart. Um, uh, for for um, so I'll give us an opportunity to thank you guys for praying for us and supporting us in our vocation. Uh, it's the least we can do. And um, yeah, I, it's, I've, I've been humbled and touched every day when I read these prayers and I offer them up to God. And, uh, and let us continue to pray for each other during this time. Yeah, so thank you. And uh, I just want to say on behalf of everyone who's been watching the live stream, uh, thank you to all uh, Father Nick, Father Brian, Sister Mary, uh, Sister John Mary, uh, thank you. It's just wonderful uh, just listening to you guys. And uh, we're very lucky to have you in our diocese. Uh, yeah, so well, thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Paul. So we'll now um, close with prayer uh, for vocations. I, I just want to thank all the panelists, um, Father Brian, Father Nick, Sister Mary Sabina, Sister John Mary, um, yeah, your presence is just so wonderful. And uh, I'd like to uh, thank all the viewers who joined us uh, through Zoom and YouTube. Um, I'd like to thank um, Mona for her wonderful performance and Paul for sharing uh, words about the prayer initiative. And I would also like to thank um, my assistant, Brian Abbas, who uh, was doing the tech support. Uh, and, and thank you again for all of you who have sent us the questions. Uh, sorry, we couldn't get to all of them, but uh, I think uh, we've uh, gotten yeah, many excellent questions. And uh, I, I think uh, this was a very fruitful time for all of us. So let's now uh, close with a prayer for vocations. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. O oh God, you have chosen the apostles to make disciples of all nations, and by baptism and confirmation have called all of us to build up your holy church. We earnestly implore you to choose from among us, your children, many priests, deacons, brothers, and sisters, who will love you with their whole heart and will gladly spend their entire lives to make you known and loved by all. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, thank you all. Thank you so much.